Many people want to understand what the power of arrest actually is and what it entails and where the law and the force of the law is derived from, whether it's by a police officer or whether it's by a civilian. So that's what I'm addressing in this video. So welcome back. I'm the Black Belt Barrister helping you to understand law. So please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos. So an arrest is defined in Jowett's Dictionary of English Law as the restraining of a person's liberty in order to compel obedience to the order of a court of justice justice, to prevent the commission of a crime or to ensure that a person charged or suspected of a crime may be answerable for it. To arrest a person is to restrict his freedom under lawful authority. And it's this lawful authority and the restriction of freedom that I'm going to look at in this video and of course the purpose of it to compel obedience to a court of law and to be answerable to a crime. Starting with police officers, police officers are given a general power of arrest by the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, commonly referred to as PACE, specifically in section 24. If certain criteria are met, including the reasonable grounds for suspicion, which I'll go into in a minute, then the police officer may carry out an arrest. The use of force in effecting an arrest is covered in the Criminal Law Act of 1967, specifically section three. Ordinary citizens, however, only have a very limited power of arrest, and that's for indictable offenses. And these are set out in PACE section 24A. However, the common law power of arrest to prevent a breach of the peace still exists and is still used extensively by police officers, although much more infrequently than the standard power of arrest in section 24. So carrying out an arrest is typically by a form of words that makes it clear to the person who's being arrested that they are no longer to freely move about or leave as they choose. Or this might be by physically seizing, touching or restraining that person and then telling them as soon as possible afterwards that they are under arrest. And this was decided in 1969 in a case called Alderson and Booth. But it may be the case that words by themselves are not sufficient. So if an officer were to say, I arrest you and the person runs off, and there was no physical contact to detain and prevent the person from leaving, this arrest may not be complete. Moving on to the use of force, as I said, this is covered in the Criminal Law Act of 1967, specifically section 3.1. A person may use such force as is reasonable in the circumstances in the prevention of crime, or in effecting or assisting in the lawful arrest of offenders or suspected offenders or of persons unlawfully at large. And of course, there are different levels of force that might be reasonable depending on the circumstances, either to effect the arrest or to defend oneself whilst carrying out an arrest. And it might be the case, as noted in a case in 1996, that more force might be seen as reasonable to effect an arrest than it might be for self-defence. This is understandable because the person making the arrest might need to exert more force on that person to keep them there and prevent their escape than simply self-defence. So the broad scope of the power of arrest covered in section 24 of PACE is that a constable may arrest anyone who is about to commit an offence, anyone who is in the act of committing an offence, anyone whom he has reasonable grounds for suspecting to be about to commit an offence, anyone whom he has reasonable grounds for suspecting to be committing an offence. And if a constable has reasonable grounds for suspecting that an offence has been committed, he may arrest anyone whom he has reasonable grounds to suspect of being guilty of that offence. And if an offence has been committed, a constable may arrest, without a warrant, anyone who is guilty of the offence, anyone whom he has reasonable grounds to be suspecting of being guilty of that offence. And interestingly, before 2006, officers could only arrest for what was known as an arrestable offence and that did not include minor offences. Although an amendment to PACE was made in section 110 of the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act of 2005. In this, officers were given a power of arrest for all offences. And also various acts of parliament will include a specific power of arrest in given situations. Quite typically for antisocial behaviour, for example, the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act of 2014 refers to powers of arrest in several different places. For example, under section four, a court granting an injunction under section one may attach a power of arrest to a prohibition or requirement of that injunction. So if someone has been given an order for antisocial behavior, for example, they've been banned for a certain area, the court granting that injunction might attach a power of arrest so that if that person is found in that area from which they have been banned under the order, the power of arrest would automatically entitle the police to arrest them for being in that area simply for nothing more than being there because they were ordered not to be there by the court. 
There is also a scenario commonly referred to as a breach of the peace, and this has been dealt with in Section 40 of the Public Order Act of 1986. Some people might think of this as a public order offence or simply breach of the peace. And this is a power that police can use to get involved in a situation to deal with either something that's already going on or something that is about to happen. For example, if there is about to be a fight break out between two or more individuals, the police would step in to intervene and prevent a breach of the peace in this situation. There might be some cases where there was a mistaken arrest. That is where the police officer has ultimately made a mistake but carry out an arrest anyway. One such case was the McCann and the Crown Prosecution Service in 2015. The court had held that where a protester had been arrested for obstructing an officer in the execution of his duty was lawful, even though the police had believed that the road being obstructed was a public highway when in fact it was not a public road. So in this case there was a mistake by the officer as to whether or not it was a public road, but for obstructing the police officer an arrest was made and the court held that this was lawful. Many people have also talked about the Mental Health Act and people being detained under the Mental Health Act. Now the police have powers to detain under the Mental Health Act that are not specifically powers of arrest. For example, Section 135, the removal of persons from a private premises under warrant, and Section 136, the removal of persons from public places. Section 136 states that a person who appears to him to be suffering from a mental disorder and to be in immediate need of care or control can be removed to a place of safety and detained there without their consent for a maximum of 72 hours. So moving briefly on to unlawful arrest. Well, first of all, where an arrest has taken place, it is for the person who has made the arrest, whether civilian or police officer, to establish that it was a lawful arrest. And this was decided in a case in 1988. And to establish this, there must be reasons, reasonable grounds, belief, and it must be necessary. If an arrest was initially found to be lawful, there are other provisions in place that require that the continued detention must also be lawful. This is in section 34 of PACE. A person arrested for an offence shall not be kept in police detention except in accordance with PACE part 4. And of particular relevance for this is the review process. The first of which is that no later than six hours after the detention was first authorised. The second shall be no later than nine hours after the first and subsequent reviews at intervals of not more than nine hours. If there's a failure to comply with the provisions of PACE, this might give rise to a claim for false imprisonment. It would therefore be for the police to demonstrate that the detention and continued detention remained lawful all the while a person is held in police custody. So as you can imagine, this is a very detailed subject and this is a very broad overview. If you have specific questions, please leave them in the comments box below. And whilst this obviously cannot amount to legal advice, I am happy to do further videos to explain any individual aspect of each of these things I've talked about. So in the meantime, remember to subscribe so you receive those future videos. And as always, thank you for watching.